Those are some very nice words. Can't wait to meet the guy, Dallas. <laughs> Amen. So, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I appreciate you uh, asking me to, to speak today. Um, I have really thoroughly, personally, really enjoyed um, Haley and Naoma's messages over the past couple weeks. Uh, they, they blessed me, and you guys did a fantastic job. I see Naoma. I don't see Haley's here where she's at, but... Um, it really, uh, they did a fantastic job, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I did hear that Nama made a few comments about me and, and hers, so I got uh, about three pages of notes just for Naoma's stuff that I have that I'm going to bring up. I just kid, just kid. But no, so the, uh, the message that I have prepared for today is going to be a little bit different. Um, and I'm going to start off with talking about the, uh, the, the title real quick. And the reason, because it kind of sits a little funny in everybody, at least in my heart. It just doesn't quite sound right. Um, and the, the message uh, that we're talking about today is following the crowd. And we hear so many times, you know, don't just follow the crowd. But today we're going to talk about following the crowd. If you have your Bibles, you stand if you're able to. We're going to go to Matthew 21. We're going to start with verse 6 and go through 11. We have it on the screens as well. Matthew 21, 6 through 11 says, The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats on the, uh, in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. The crowds going down ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings. Lord, I thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for this wonderful time and this wonderful worship service that we have had. Lord, I ask you to touch each and every heart in here. Lord, help me not to speak with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of your power and of your love and of your anointing. And we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we never fail to give you the praise and the glory for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. In your blessed and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As I said, we're going to talk about following the crowd. You hear all the time of don't follow the crowd. You know, if your friend jumped off the bridge, would you do that too? And all those sort of things. We're going to take a little bit different look of, about following a crowd and following the crowd and what it's all about. If you can pull up, just don't, don't start the video yet. So this video uh, doesn't have any sound or anything like that. So I'm going to kind of introduce this video and what's going on to you. Um, this is the opening of the Millennium Bridge in London in June 10th of 2000. So this bridge, it was created by the, um, and built by the engineer, and he had this vision when he was told, told to, to make this bridge that he didn't want anything to block the view of those that are passing over the bridge. So he wanted to, everybody to be able to see the skyline, to see the water, almost looked like light going across the river. So he built it, and as you can see, there, all of the suspension parts are on the side. So as these pe the crowd of people began to walk across the bridge, it began to shake. And as you can see, it almost looks like everybody is forcing it to shake, but it's actually shaking with just them walking around. The people on the side almost looks like they're pushing on it, but they're just standing there trying to stand upright. As it pans out, you can see that entire line of people all walking as a big sway, walking in rhythm. See, the thing is... This, built, this bridge was constructed, there you can see the supports on the side that I was talking about. It almost looks like guitar strings type of deal. So what it was, the way it was built, it um, didn't have anything overhead and everything went along the bridge. The bridge had a natural give and sway. All bridges ha and buildings have to have some sort of sway, otherwise they'll crumble and they'll break. So they have some sort of movement. However, the frequency of this London bridge was right about 2.2 hertz, the way they measured the frequency of this sway. The problem with, with that that they didn't take into account when they were building the bridge is that humans walk about 1.8 to 2 hertz. So you have this br bridge starting to sway, and then you have all the people walking across the bridge at almost the same pace. So it started getting worse. It started getting worse. And as you can see, it, see people are having a harder time standing on it. They ended up closing the bridge. It didn't have any, it suffer any damage or anything like that. It was able to withstand the, the movement, 
but they had to fix it where the, the movement of the bridge and the movement of the people weren't exactly the same or nearly the same. So what they found out is that a group of people walking will start to walk in time with each other right about that two hertz. And as you can see in the crowd, you can see them start into that rhythm and the bridge starts swaying. They start going back and forth because they were all getting in the same rhythm and about the same pace along with the bridge. And then as the bridge got worse, everybody's trying to compensate and lean back and forth, which just makes it all worth worse, like swinging on a swing. So point number one, it ain't that it's a crowd, but who is that crowd following? The very first scripture that we talked about and that we read, Matthew 21, the uh, disciples, they got the colt and they got the donkey, just like Jesus has said. And then he start, he's riding into town. We're not going to focus too much on the backstory and what's going on, but the fact that there was a crowd that was with him. And they started taking their coats off, and they're putting it on the donkeys, and they're taking the, the branches, they're cutting them, and they're laying, they're preparing the way, and they're praising him and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they're praising the Lord. This is all good things. Can we all agree that was a good thing that they did? Amen. The crowd began to praise him. Let's look at another spot. Matthew 27, 20 through 23 says, But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Crucify him. And he said, What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, Crucify him. Now, this is only a few verses after the crowd was praising Jesus. And then we, now we have another crowd that's saying, crucify him, crucify him. What happened with the other crowd? What is different about these two crowds? What's different is who they're following. The first crowd is following Jesus, listening to what he's teaching, listening to the words and applying that and doing that. The second crowd was listening to the chief priest. And they were listening to the elders, and they weren't following Jesus once, uh, whatever, at all. And that is where their mistake comes in. So, as I said, point number one is it ain't that it's a crowd, it's who the crowd is following. If you've ever watched National Geographic almost whatsoever, um, you probably have seen a bird's eye view or camera, though sometimes it'll be a drone nowadays or it'll be a, hel a, a helicopter or a plane flying over, and you'll see these herds and they'll see the movement of these herds. And it'll be these huge group, and it, it doesn't matter if it's wildebeest or if it's antelope or whatever, there's these huge crowd of, or a herd of hundreds of these things, and they'll be running, and they'll be running along. Sometimes the helicopter is kind of chasing them and scaring them off. But they move in this almost beautiful, synchronized motion. There's hundreds of them down there. Sometimes there's thousands. I've seen video, vi videos where they say there's millions of these different animals, and they're all moving in sync and moving together as one almost, almost like water just flowing. And there'll be a, maybe a cliff up ahead, and you'll see them all just, and they avoid the cliff. Or there may, may be danger over here, and you just, they all go to the other side, and they avoid the danger. Or I saw one time there was some big rock or tree or something, and the whole herd is coming out, and they just, without bumping into each other, without knocking each other around, they just, they go right around and close the gap on the other side. See, I was watching this documentary on how herds move around. It was on Net, uh, National Geographic and how herds move. To see, that what they do is they all have the same mindset. They want to live. They don't want to die. And they don't want to get eaten. It's pretty simple. So if one of them sees something that's going to kill them or not let them live and make them die or get eaten, they, they take off running. Boop. All the other ones, they don't have to see the danger. They know there's danger. So I like to, to hunt white-tailed deer. And other hunters here that get the idea, same idea. But. White-tailed de deer are called white-tailed because they have white underneath their tail. And every hunter knows if you see the white, what was that again, Dallas? It is not good. They are gone. Boop. Do you see that white? You'll see them even get nervous and kind of pop it up a little bit. Like, oh, is there something? Is there something? But as soon as that white tail comes up, they all leave. Only one of them had to smell you or see you or hear you, and they're 
all gone. They all take off because there's danger, and they know that. So they move together because the, the herd gives them some uh, support, and they, they help each other out. The word herd is actually an old English word. Uh, it might mess up the way it is pronounced, but heord. And it actually means keeping care for custody. The word herd itself talks about keeping care of one another. So the herd also offers protection. The younger ones are generally pushed toward the center of the herd, so that way they can keep, keep them safe from the dangers that might be out on the outskirts. Um, Dallas was speaking uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about this and with lions and how they'll, they'll stay on the outskirts and they'll wait for that one to wander a little too far from the herd and wa- it'll start wandering and, put, and going to the out- outside. And that's when they'll separate them because they know they can't take on the herd, but they can take on the one, not a problem, because they have their own little gr- group just waiting to pounce and waiting to attack. Another thing that it offers, the herd will start to lead the, uh, the younger ones. And the newer ones that are, that are new and that are young, and cut, they'll lead them to the good pastures. They'll lead them to where, where it's safe for them to eat. And it's okay, here's a good spot to stop and rest and eat, and there's no danger. The ones on the outside can keep an eye on everything. They'll lead them to the good spots to, to eat. Also, if you've uh, ever watched the birds, um, it's beautiful, another synchronized motion that they'll do when they're uh, traveling, you know, north to south, and they're going following the good weather um, and south to north, kind of go back and forth, the birds migrating, they all stay together because it helps them with their sense of direction. The younger ones, they don't know where they're going yet, but they follow all the older ones. And they stay with that group because they, everybody, they, everybody else knows where, where we're heading, so they learn these things from them. It keeps them in a sense of direct, direction and it keeps that common goal. Uh, Manfred F.R.D., don't know how to pronounce the last name. He's an author uh, for Harvest Business Review, Harvard Business Review. He's quoted as saying, to thrive, people need a direction and goals to look forward to. People who lack a clear sense of purpose find little meaning in whatever they are doing. See, so many times we can, if we, if we don't have that common purpose, if we don't have that common, common goal, something we are work, working towards, it's easy to veer off. You get caught up in this and caught up in that, and the next, next thing you know, you're over here facing a wall, and you're supposed to be heading out the door. It gets you off track. If we have that goal that says it doesn't matter what's coming this way and what's coming this way, I'm going to take my next step. I'm heading this way, and I got Dallas over here to help me along. He's like, hey, this is where we're heading, right? Yes, yeah, that's where we're heading, and Pete's over here. Hey, don't go over here. Watch out for this, and oh, thanks. I appreciate that, and you were heading towards your goal. That's what a herd gives you. All right, buckle up here. We're going to make a hard left turn, all right? You ready? We're going to start talking about the Titanic, okay? I know that's a big shift, but it kind of makes sense, sense here in just a second, okay? Excuse me here. The Titanic, the ocean liner that, as we know, has, had tragically sunk. It had, um, it, was, it had struck an iceberg, and it was unable to avoid the iceberg for a few different reasons, many different reasons, but we'll talk about a couple of them. When the iceberg was spotted, it was about 900 feet away from the ship. The, uh, the Titanic needed about a half mile or 2,640 feet to come to, to a complete stop from full, full steam ahead. Obviously, 900 feet was not enough time to get the ship to stop, and that's why it had struck the, the iceberg. However, it's documented there were multiple um, warnings that the Titanic had received. And the mindset, um, it just seems that the mindset of the crew and of the captain and everybody on the ship is to, we got this, we can do it on our own, this ship is not going to sink. As he, they were quoted as saying, even God cannot sink this ship. And so the, the, they had a bit of arrogance about them. One of the warnings they received was 19 miles ahead from the, from the Californian. The message was sent to the Titanic an hour beforehand, and again, 19 miles, plenty of time to stop. The Californian, which was another ship, sent, we are stopped and surrounded by ice. The response that the the radio operator sent to the Californian was, shut up, I'm busy. 
19 miles to get that ship to a stop safely and save those souls. And his response was, shut up, I'm busy. It was reported that he was busy sending messages and doing things for all the passengers and take, taking on all the other orders, and he was just overwhelmed. The problem was they had that arrogance about them. Don't, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that ice. Hey, but it's going to sink your ship, and all your people are going to be in the ocean. We got this. We are in the Titanic. Even God can't sink this ship. If they would have heeded those warnings... If they would have just listened a little bit harder and paid attention, someone else said, hey, there's ice ahead. Let's bring it to a stop, and then we can send all these messages. They lost that common goal of to get to where you're going. They were try, trying to break records and all sorts of things, and that was the common goal with this group and with the, with the, um, the captain and everybody. We're breaking records. We're going to get to New York faster than anybody else. But they did not heed any of the warnings. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13 where it says, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all of the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and we all made to drink of one spirit. See, it doesn't matter. Um, you're going to be a part of some type of crowd, some type of group, or some type of herd, some type of crowd you're in the middle of, whether you know it or not. You're fo following the people that are focused on Jesus Christ, or you're following people that are not, or you're in the outskirts uh, somewhere in between. If you're look looking at the crowd over he here heading towards the parties and the drinking and the drugs and the alcohol and all this kind of stuff, and you're following over here at Jesus Christ, but you're walking over here, did you know, and my wife tells me this all the time, She'll say something to me, and I'll look over, and I'm like, well, you know, because when you, when you don't know, I don't hear very well. I wear hearing aids, and it helps to read lips a little bit. And I'll look over, and I'm like, she's like, hey, watch the road. I am watching. Oh, didn't see that. I am watching the road. Well, you looked right, and you drove right. Just for a second. I just did it for a second, and then we got back straight. So when you're looking, that's where you're going to go. Um, Dallas, I'm not a golfer, first of all, but Dallas told me one time, we went to the driving range one time, he said, you look where you want your ball to go, and then you line yourself up, and then you look at the ball, because you got to hit the ball. If you look out there where you're wanting the ball to go, you're going to miss the ball, you're going to miss the whole point. Where your eyes are is where your focus is, and that's where you're going to be heading except for the golf part. I still didn't hit that ball very well, <laughs> to be honest. But that's the goal. So, the get back on track here. Right? Here we, so you're finding, following some sort of crowd. If you start leaning to one side, leaning to the other, and God's trying to bring you back, and God in the, the herd is saying, hey, 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 you're getting, getting too far out. You're, you're going to get hurt. Something else about a ship um, from the Titanic to the big ocean liners today, they almost still turn in the same way, in the same method. They have a rudder in the back, and it turns from one side to the other to turn the entire however long ship. That rudder goes to one side or to the other, and it pivots the whole ship. The, there's, a, there's stops on the rudder that keep it from turning too far because you can only turn that ship to one, a certain amount. Otherwise, it'll have catastrophic failure on the rudder and can even capsize the ship. So you can only turn it so much at a time. The reason for that is because as, as that rudder pivots, it starts to have to basically pull on the entire ship. So the ship's obviously long. It's fighting the water current. That rudder is fighting the movement of the ship itself any airflow, that one rudder is pulling on the front of the ship, trying to just get it back on course. And as it drifts this way, it's pulling it back, trying to get on course. Remember we were talking about a herd. And what does a herd do? It sees the danger and it starts to move. Almost instantaneous. A ship, on the other hand, it's a fight and it's a struggle. Maybe we'll get back over here because it's it being bombarded by everything else, it doesn't work like a body. 
it doesn't work together in one fluid motion to move. So I have a question for you. If you have issues in your life and something that starts to get you veering off track, is it like Pete comes up and says, hey, this isn't right for you. And you say, you know what, you're right. And you come back on track. Or is it you start walking along and you start veering off track, off course, and Pete says, hey, that's not the way to go for you, man. That's not, you, that's not what the Bible's lined up. And you say, yeah, I know, but it's over here. And it's kind of nice if you look, and Pete's now over here. Now he's not even next to you because you keep on veering farther and farther away from the hurt. But remember what I said is on the outskirts, that's where the danger is. Now, you might get away with it once or twice. You might be able to step over here, and then Rob may be even close, like, hey, get back over here, and you might be able to come back. But one of these times, you're going to drift too far, and next thing you know, you're surrounded by lions, and where's everybody that's supposed to be helping me? They've been trying. I'm trying, but they also have to keep themselves safe, too. They have to be, be protected, and you have wandered so far, and now next thing you know, that lion's there to pounce. The herd is here to protect you. And if you constantly are having to be drugged back and you're fighting with everything, that's not moving like a herd. The herd's looking out for you. Or how about uh, not even drifting to the point of, you know, sinning or anything like that, but just in your marriage. You and your wife or you and your, your family has to be, to be focused on Jesus and focused on God and focused in lining your life up. As the word says, Naomi went through some, I'm not going to click on that. <laughs> Naomi gave some great scripture references for all of these things, for getting in your word, for praying and for fasting and for getting into, uh, into with other believers and to going into small groups and being in service and all of these things. She gave scripture references, so we're not going to go back into that. Just watch her message. She gave great references for those because it's all biblical. So all of these things, what it's trying to do is get you on the right path and keep you on the straight and narrow to protect you. So if in your family you have an issue that arises, whether it's a um, financial issue, whether it's a kid issue, it doesn't matter what it is, you have an issue, you're, all, you're, you're working to get together and you're moving as a body and as a herd together, you don't start veering and it's not a fight with, okay, we got to do this and we got to do this. And God's saying, well, if you stay in my word, and you're like, yeah, but I got this guy over here. He's just driving me nuts. This kid won't do anything I say. But you were moving together. So you, you avoid those pitfalls Almost instantaneously. Yeah, you may have to go way over here to come down the hill, but you didn't fall off the cliff. It might be a little longer. It might be a little harder, but you're safe because you're working together as a team and as a group, and you're flowing together. What would the church be like? What would our church be like or the church in the U.S. look like if we didn't fight and we didn't push and shove and fight our, our own agendas and what we want? No. We focus on Jesus Christ. We focus on the word. We line our church up with that. And any dangers that fall, we can avoid them. Because we work together as one group, as one body, just as the scripture says. Remember I talked about that crowd, that they get in a rhythm. And they say once you start into that rhythm, if you're still focused on where you're going, it's easier to keep that rhythm. I used to work with a guy who he was in the, he was a firefighter in the military and one thing that he had, was taught is that when, even when you're not marching in formation, but even walking down the hallway, they wanted you to walk in sync with each other because it, kept, it looked nicer. It looks uniform. So he was taught, even if you're talking with somebody, walking to the bathrooms or the mess hall or anything like that, you're supposed to get in step with each other. Well, that stuck because it became such a habit with him that even at the firehouse, he's out of the military, and he, now he's walking to, with, with us, talking, heading to lunch or whatever, and he, he'll do a little double step to get in pace with you. Well, I'm a smart aleck, so I'd always do a little double step, step to get out of, smart, out of pace. And there's always that guy, you know, and it's usually me. But, but it became a habit. It becomes easier because you're staying in pace with each other. Amen. Music team can come on up. There's a few things I want to get in with this, um, with this altar call. Because I think it's important. And 
some of the stuff we've kind of already talked about. But first of all, if you're in the wrong crowd, what have, you have to take take a look at yourself and what crowd are you following? Who are you following after? Are you following after Jesus Christ? And are you going after and pressing towards him? Or are you following after just that crowd that is maybe might be a bigger crowd, might be a louder crowd, might have a little bit more fun over here. But the next thing you, you know, they start yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And you know what? It may not even be quite that obvious. It might be the things of, yeah, I don't feel like going to church either. What's the point? It's just a building. You can have church at home, which you can, and sometimes that's necessary. But what's going on in here? That's where, where you're either following the right crowd, you're following Jesus Christ, or you're veering. And like I said, eventually, something's over here waiting for you. The next part is... Are you in church? Yeah, all right. Yeah, I pray. I just don't want to get too deep in it. I mean, come on. If I can make it into glory, I can make it into glory. But every time God leads you down something, you're like, ah. He's turn, he has to turn that rudder. I don't, think, I don't really think I want to head that way. I mean, it's difficult. It's rough. It's easy just to keep on heading where I'm heading. If I get, then I think I'll get to glory. Does God keep on having to, every time he gives you a task? Is it a fight? Is it a struggle? Maybe you eventually start heading that direction. Or is it, I'm just going to fight everything tooth and nail. The third thing is as a body, as a whole, and as, as a congregation, as a church, as believers, we need to oper operate as one. It's not that everybody's going to agree with every little thing, but the foundations in the scripture we can agree on and we should agree on. And if there's something that, that's in our way or there's an obstacle or dan danger, we can avoid it and we can move around because we, we need a group, we need a crowd to operate as one. To reach this community, we need a group. Dallas can't reach everybody. Pete can't reach everybody. I live all the way out in Dry Ridge. We, we need help. We need to work with each other. Are you drifting? Is it difficult for God to lead you? And let's operate together. Those are the three things for the altar call. You can find yourself a place to pray. They're gonna, they're either going to go into a song. The prayer team can come up. Now let's bring, bring, bring these three things, whichever one you are. If you need prayer for something, prayer team's here. Dallas is here. I'll pray with you. Let's all get on the same page, same mindset, and avoid the pitfalls and avoid the danger.